don't you think it's about time that we have more systemic change in our schools? I mean, a few years ago, we were saying there's 30 plus years of research that shows inclusive education benefits all students. And now we're saying 40 plus years of research is showing us that inclusive education benefits all students. And yet it is still a struggle for so many families and for so many teachers that want to see change also. Well, if you can relate to this, this is going to be an intriguing show that you don't want to miss because we are going to be talking about how we can impact change. And yes, even ideas that were written about in the 1990s, <laughs> several decades ago, still are so appropriate and so powerful tools that we can use today. So I have with me a wonderful guest, Barb Buswell, who is the executive director of Peak Parent Center in Colorado. And Barb and I go back several decades. It's like decades is on my mind, right? <laughs> um, and we both have been advocates for our sons when they were in school and helped develop their self-advocacy skills. And Barb's going to be sharing her son Wilson's story. And what I love about it is a lot of it came from her older son and some of the questions that he was asking about his brother and the school that his brother went to. So that's going to be an intriguing story. I want to welcome our live and our replay viewers. Type in your comments and questions because we love to interact with you guys. Um, Barb is also a wonderful fiber artist. You might not know that about her. <laughs> and we both love color. So we might like go into some tints, some shades, some tone kind of speaking today, but don't worry, it will all be fun and engaging. <laughs> so Barb, welcome to our show. And I thought it'd be wonderful for you to share a little bit about parent centers because so many teachers and parents really don't understand the resources that they have available for them. Good morning. Thanks, Charmaine. I'm really excited to be here. And I'm sure we'll get into hues and tints and colors, all kinds of things. So Parent Centers, Peak is Colorado's <clears throat> Parent Training and Information Center, also known as the PTI. Um, there are other parent centers called CPRCs, and those are Community Parent Resource Centers. Both of these are funded by the U.S. Department of Ed. And the reason that parent centers came to be is after the special ed law was passed in 1975, parents were always supposed to be at the table. But schools didn't know how to involve parents. Parents didn't really understand the system, sometimes I call it the game, so people couldn't advocate effectively. So the U.S. Department of Ed um, funds, and this is in the special ed law, um, IDEA, funds more than 90 parent centers. So there's at least one statewide parent center in states like Colorado and Idaho. Um, there's one in large states, urban states, there, are, there often are more than one parent centers. And so the goal is that parent centers are available to families and to teachers to help um, equalize the playing field for kids who have special needs, who have disabilities, I don't like to say special needs, and um, help give, give families the tools and information so they can be equal players at the table. And they're able to really individualize what works for kids. So there's a parent center in every state. So you should use your parent center. You can always contact Peak, but you should use them. And there is a website for all families in the country that's part of this that is parentcenterhub.org. And you can find information out about your state and parent center there. So um, I 
should I just kind of transition into sure. <laughs> so when my son, who's now 40, when he was born, the first year of his life, I have three kids. Let me let me step back. I have three kids. I have a son that is 42, a son that's 40, and a daughter who's 37, I think. I hope <laughs> that's right. If not, it's 36. So um and um when my son, my middle son was born and ended up having significant challenges because he lost oxygen. The first year of his life, we were not connected with anybody. We were only us and I was driving, we lived in the mountains and I was driving downtown all the time for therapies and they would take my son Wilson away. And my older son, Brooke and I had to sit politely. He had to sit politely. I saw it, so did I, in a chair and be nice and hear Wilson cry a lot. And so it was not a good time. We didn't we didn't meet any other families. It was really stressful. So I don't like to be in that kind of a role. <clears throat> and so we try. I tried to find out a lot of information. And um, part of the information I did find out was when Wilson was three was about parent centers and that they were funded. And I happened to hear about that. And then I got a fellow warrior parent to write a proposal to the US Department of Ed. And that's how PEAK got started. So um, I felt like any of the tools that I'd learned, any of the strategies that worked, I needed to give away because it was too hard to find. And it was really hard experientially. So um, <clears throat> uh, of the, of so when my son was born, he had lots of intensive needs. He still does today. And when we went to professionals, everyone kept saying, "Oh, he is severe. Oh, he needs this. Oh, he has to do this and that. And all I wanted to do was just have a happy family and let my two young boys be together and do things. So I thought we should just have the regular life that we would have if, if Wilson hadn't had some birth challenges. No one seemed to understand. And I liked <clears throat> in your, in your uh, publicity, Charmaine, how many times have people said, have they said in the past, and do they still say, don't you understand? Your son needs a lot. Oh, yeah, I think I got it. But they they thought that when I said, Wilson needs to play, he needs to be part of everything, people thought, what's wrong with this woman? Doesn't she know? And she, he needs therapy. And I was like, no, he needs to play and swim and do other things. And I need to learn how to help him. But he needs to have a life. Um, so, uh, and then people would say, well, you know, he might not ever walk or drive a car when he's 16. And I was like, okay, but I'd like him to go swimming with us. I just want to have a little swimming fun because that's what kids this age do. So then they told me he'd be in special ed. And that was scary because I was a general ed teacher and I was a high school teacher and I was a good teacher. And I thought schools and education were fabulous and Wilson should be in the best, most exciting classrooms ever. Because if he couldn't speak and couldn't roll over and do stuff, he needed to be around kids who were experts at it. So again, don't you understand came up. Um, <clears throat> and I really didn't know anything about special ed at the time, except that it was separate. And no one, I was a general ed teacher, and no one ever invited me to kind of work with kids who need a little more sports. So I thought I didn't have any skill. So when people would say, oh, he'll be in special ed, I was like, oh gosh, this, this could be really tough because I don't know anything about special ed. Mm -hmm. um, not proud to say that, I'm just saying that was the, that was the, at the thing at the time. So Wilson went to preschool, he went to a special ed preschool and um, actually it was a really exciting um, environment. And I had gone to all these private preschools and I thought I was selling them and they're like, oh, he's not toilet trained. I'm like, oh, I don't think he ever will be and that's okay. He wants to play. 
So again, people that don't you understand. So um, we advocated that he had to be then. So, okay, I got to stop for a second. So I couldn't understand why everybody thought he was so special that he had to be away from other kids and probably even away from us. And so I tried to learn things. So I went to the public library and which is what the only thing we had those in those days. And the books were terrible about cerebral palsy. I mean, the, that they were really scary. So I got rid of those. And um, I found a real academic journal from, it's called JASH, it's from TASH, which is was the Association for People with Significant Support Needs. And there was an article inside that said that kids with significant disabilities who went to typical preschools did way better in life and the families were happy and kids could learn and all kids benefited. So I have this article and I find out about the organization. And so I saw that they were having, and I called and they were having a national meeting in San Francisco. So I decided I had to learn this. So I got somehow found the pennies and went to San Francisco and I couldn't stay in the conference hotel because it was too expensive and fancy. So I stayed in some horrible neighborhood <laughs> and went to this conference and I started meeting people and I met people who had disabilities and they were like really cool. And so I go up, I'm kind of an introvert and I go up and say, hi, I have a son. Should, should you go to general education? I just heard about that because if you go to general ed in first grade, you might get invited to a birthday party. And so, um, I don't know, I kept getting braver and braver and finding people that absolutely were convinced that what seemed right in my belly and my heart were the right things for him. Hmm. So then I came back and helped, found other colleagues, other people who had kids with um, challenges who wanted to learn with other kids. And then I learned about PEAK, about the parent centers, the PTIs, and I wrote a proposal and Pete got started. And see how, you know, I, I just have visions of like going to a library because I remember doing those kinds of things when I was looking for college, you know, it's like, so one, we have this internet, right? And we have so many wonderful resources. Um, and I guess my, you know, my caution is, to look at the credibility of the resources that we we find on the internet. And so I think, um, and let me put up this website again, when you go to credible places like, you know, your parent training center, uh, information center in your state or to this national organization, parentcenterhub.org, um, you know that you will be getting vetted information that is going to be really helpful. Um, and so you did a little bit of that research, Barb, because there was only a little bit available, right? I mean, now we have so much more research. But when you were actually having to go to the school and have a meeting or you know, if you want to share that story about, you know, what some of the questions were that Brooke had and how how Brooke as a young kid was picking up on things already. Yeah, so Brooke was two years older, but Wilson couldn't go to, we, we had to advocate hard, including uh, filing for a due process hearing. We had mediation and fortunately we had a very skilled mediator who, <laughs> Didn't, who thought maybe I understood. Um, but anyway, so he Wilson got to go to first grade. He wasn't able to go to kindergarten because didn't I know that he had special ed supports? And I'm like, of course, and kindergarten is where you play. That's where he needs to be. Anyway, he stayed in preschool. So we, we advocated and he got to go to a, an elementary school, not our neighborhood elementary school. And so I had kids in two schools. So one day, Brooke, my older son, and I had to go over to drop something off. I'm not sure why Brooke was with me. So we we go in the building, and the, it was a long ranch-style building. 
and one end had all the special ed rooms. And so we walked in, you have to walk in there to go to the rest of the building. And Brooke says, what's wrong here? I think this building might sink. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And I'm sure I was in a hurry. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, there's too many wheelchairs and there are these other contraptions. He didn't use that word, but there were standards and there were standards and all this equipment in the hall. And he said, I don't think it's probably safe. And then he said, what is wrong in that room? There's no, there are no lights on. How can kids learn to read when there are no lights? We just had a something last week about how having good light is important to read. And I'm like, okay, let's go. We got to go to Wilson's class. So we went to Wilson's class and opened the door and Wilson was in the general ed classroom, but the teacher had him back in a corner. And so he had all these tables around him and things. And so, so I'm kind of like, Brooke, don't say anything. Let's just drop this off. And so we got back in the hall and we were starting to go to our car and Brooke says, that is not a good place for Wilson. He should not be there. How can he learn when he can't talk to anybody? How can he play? How can they do things together? And how can he learn to read way back there with that older lady? So I said, well, you know, this is a step or whatever. And we get in the car and then he said, this is a bad place for Wilson. I'm I'm surprised that he's here. And so I'm just trying to drive home and get go to the grocery or do whatever I had to do. And he says, um, so mom, how can he ever learn people, learn to know the brothers and sisters of my friends? We are in a neighborhood and you told me I go to my school and steel school is the best school. We have a song about it. And why isn't Wilson good enough to go there? And I, why do you let him go over there, mom? And so I said, well, you know, I don't know what I said. So of course, um, and he said, I think he's good enough to go to our school. So then we go to the dinner table and Brooke brings this up again and says, so Wilson, I went to your school and I think it's a bad place. And I don't know what's wrong with mom, but she, you need to go to our school. You need to know, Andy, you need to know all these kids. So that really, got me in the belly and in the heart about something I needed to do. And then later, um, Wilson's sister had gone to a day camp in the summer, fabulous camp. And at the end of the week, she told the director that her brother had to come because he had a lot to teach people at the camp and he needed to be there. And then I got a call from the director saying, we don't understand why Wilson's not going here. So both of my kids uh, were really provokers. That was it. That's not the right word. But anyway, they pushed for advocacy because they just said, Wilson needs to be in the best school. He needs to go to the best camp. And he does stuff with us. And besides, he has to carry his weight and learn to read and do all the stuff just like we do. See, isn't that cool? And Mindy's here with us. And Mindy says, out of the mouth of babes, right? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And Karen is from Florence, Colorado. And Karen says, it's amazing the things kids know that adults need to remember. Yes. I think throughout Wilson's life, in terms of the things that we've learned, um, kids never have needed to be protected from him. Wilson has always been somebody who kids embrace right away. And when he when he finally got, we, he did go the next year to his neighborhood school after lots of <clears throat> haranguing and <clears throat> not haranguing because I had to use my very best social skills to get <laughs> in the door. But um, the kids, and, and we were told at our neighborhood school that it was really it's a public school. It was really for kids who were going to go to Harvard and Stanford. And so my facetiousness came out when I said, well, we, he hasn't, we haven't talked about colleges for him yet, but they could be options. It wasn't really taken to. Well, I know. And I'm sorry, I put this up here a little quick, but I wanted to share this um quote from Wilson. And if you want to kind of give us some context for it, and also the photo of Wilson rafting. Uh, right. So, um, so Wilson 
as you might guess, his brother and sister have advocated even without his parents um, to participate in everything. So Wilson went on a 10 day raft trip in Utah um, with the family and he had a bunch of cousins who helped um, do supports and he is floating in the um, Green River with his brother here. And Wilson can, um, Wilson's communication is um, challenging for him still, but he can type using facilitated communication. And this is something that Wilson typed that you have to participate in everything or you risk not participating in anything. So he wants no barriers, no boundaries, no grown up in input about what he might not be able to do because of his disability. And this photo is from a family trip that you guys took. And I was just typing in the comments, if people want to get a copy of your article, Take Risks, Ride the River, just type the word doors in the comments and hopefully my IEP bot will get you set up to get a copy of Barb's article, Take Risk, Ride the River. And I think you need to do a follow-up um, article, Barb, about um, your Burning Man trip. Because, I mean, think of the lessons that, that everybody learned there. And just, I don't know, it just shows the, um, the richness that your family has always had as a priority and that everybody does, you know, when you go on a family trip, everybody goes and you figure it out and you have such a can do we can figure out how to grind food on the river trip <laughs> and do g2 food feedings um and i think that has you know permeated the vision that you have and then also the mission for peak parent center and before we leave today, I want to make so somebody can remind me in the comments. <laughs> I want to talk also about Peak's upcoming conference in Denver um, about inclusive education. And you will be able to hear wonderful people like Jonathan Mooney and mm -hmm. Patrick Schwartz and all kinds of people. So in a few minutes, we'll talk about the conference. Um, so the other thing that I was wondering about is, you know, what what do you think are some, I don't know, you know, some takeaways or some values or I don't know, like some kind of insights that you've had over the years that you know will be helpful, you know, for parents and teachers that are tuning in. Well, I guess I mean, we already talked about one of the things. I think listening to the kids, whether it's his brother and sister, who are such strong advocates. Um, I also, when Wilson was little, people tried to get me to go to sibling trainings and get ready because they were going to need special support groups and things. Um, Wilson has been an incredible teacher, and <clears throat> they... All, all three of my kids are powerful advocates for social justice. Um, I think one of the things I learned is that a disability is not a medical issue at all. It's much more a social justice issue, it's access. And people who can, can address how we can make things work, whether it's on the river, whether it's at Burning Man or whatever, those folks can, we all walk along and Wilson seems like his, his needs seem like nothing. And people who are in the why mode, I don't think that they ever get it. So I think that listening, um, being listening, to, especially to kids, listening to, I mentioned earlier, self-advocates, adults with disabilities um, have been great role models for Wilson and have been really encouragers for me. And I, I think that what I learned is I got to believe in my community and I got to believe in kids and the kids around him. Um, and in there are good teachers everywhere and the good teachers loved teaching Wilson and found it really interesting. Um, and so I, I got to find those kinds of allies. And that still is true today, whether it's 
I mean, I don't know, Charmaine Dillon and Wilson were young when we met as partners <clears throat> in leadership. But we were two souls, among others, who were going to try to figure things out so our kids could have great lives. And so finding allies to be around, whether it's through this group, whether it's through your parent center, whether it's through your community, I think that's that keeps me going. Because I'm, I, I used to be, I still am, a conflict avoider. And so the idea that my husband and I, who were both teachers, would have to fight to have my kid get into general ed was crazy. That was the most perplexing thing. I should have sent you this slide. Wilson's first IEP in our neighborhood school had 17 people there, 15 yeah. professionals and his dad and me, and yeah. everyone telling us about, oh, don't you understand? And so he's just a kid who needed to learn what second graders need to learn. Right. Oh, exactly. And, and Barbara and I were talking a few minutes before we went live, and she reminded me of Doug Bicklin's book. And so this is going to be one of our giveaways today. And I also have a second giveaway. But Barb, there's a quote that Doug has in his book, um, Schooling Without Labels. And I would love if you could read that because it's so powerful. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so Doug writes about families and how families look at situations in the eye and figure things out. And he said, <clears throat> can schools and other social institutions adopt the vision of families in which the person with a disability is a full participant in everyday life? The question for schools is, should they fashion themselves as gatekeepers engaged in a careful, if somewhat arbitrary sorting process, putting kids in the place in their place? Or is it the rule of schools to be gate openers, creating opportunities? Like families, schools could use the crucible of everyday events as the proper context for as assessing how to include and educate students. This is an alternative to a common practice of assessing to place kids. So because placement tends to catalog students by their deficits or disabilities, and the former family approach focuses only on issues of teaching and learning and participating. And so I, I don't know what the date is on this book, but I remember reading that and saying, yes, this is, this is it. Well, and so I said, so keep making comments because at the end of the show, we will draw a name. So 1992 and the books from the nineties are still so powerful. Um, and it's still something we can learn from. The other book that I want to give away today is one um, of Barb's books that she um, co-authored opening doors and um, it just has the golden nuggets <laughs> of how to make inclusive education work from parent point point of views from self advocates from professionals in the you know in the education system um, and so I love this book so much and I'm going to pick a person in a few minutes that will receive this as a present because it's a wonderful book that you can use either if you're the parent or you can share it with the teachers that your, the, your child um, works with and it will make huge differences. And that's our goal is that we continue to open those doors for all and then I also think about a good friend that Barb and I both have and yes, her son was participating and active in general ed, but guess what? He was going, entering the school building in a, with a separate door, a separate entrance. So it's not just opening doors, but making sure that that's the front door that we're opening um, and that all kids are seen as having contributions um, that they can make. So Barb, I would love for you, and let me put up this slide for you to talk a little bit about the conference coming up in February. 20th and 21st. Yes, 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 yes. So let me, um, 
if you want to talk about who some of the keynote speakers are going to be. Um, <clears throat> yes, you mentioned Jonathan Mooney. Oh, he is he's amazing. And he has a new book that you all should read called Normal Sucks. Hey. And his topic is going to be Normal Sucks. And I think that's another thing that I learned that <clears throat> Normal is just a social construct. It doesn't mean a thing. And so the idea is that disability brings uniquenesses, not abnormal or unnormal. It's um, so anyway, and he is very, very entertaining. So Patrick Schwartz is coming too. And he and John Mooney and Patrick Schwartz both happen to have disability labels themselves. Um, Patrick is going to talk about <clears throat> the instructional practices. He's going to be the can-do guy for how to make it work in a school. Um, John's going to talk about why it's important and tell stories. We also are going to have Michael McSheehan, who's a great guy. and He was part of this a national project called SWIFT, and they worked in, I think, over 60 schools around the country, elementary and middle schools, and they um, it was a federal project and they gave um, technical assistance and schools totally transformed themselves to include all the kids. And Michael is going to talk about new research because there are still kids, he calls them with big labels, kids that have S in their title, meaning significant, severe or something. And Michael is going to talk about the research and the practice and how well kids who um, happen have big labels, how well they learn and how much learning is enhanced for everybody. And then we have this family who spoke, is going to come. It's a general ed teacher, a sibling, a sister. My kids don't like to be called siblings. I know. As soon as Wilson came in, so now we have to be a sibling. I know. So they just want to be a brother and a sister. So a sister who's 14, um, a young man who's 11, and the, reg the general ed teacher are going to talk about how this family pushed and how the school and the grades and the district changed. So and they're very, very cool. We got to hear them in Washington last summer. Uh, so those are the keynoters. And then we have people talking about behavior and transition and early childhood, all kinds of things. And at the conference, one of the, I think, unique things about the Peak conference is that when sessions are going on, there's nobody in the hall. A lot of time when I go to grown-up conferences, people are out having coffee and talking to each other. But the sessions are really lively and exciting. And all we ask all of the speakers to be very practical and to talk about what works. You can get research elsewhere, or we'll help you find research later. But what can you take home Monday, whether you're a mom, a dad, a, a general educator, a special educator, university person, whomever, what can you take home so that you can change, change the world and do things that are going to get you down the path that you want to go? Plus, in Colorado, we, we feel like this is really, really at a peak. And I know, Charmaine, you endorse this. This is really hard work. This is social justice change for equity. If we think about that, it's pretty overwhelming, but that's what we're doing. So I don't think we can do anything that hard unless you have fun. So we um, will be sure if you come to the conference that you're going to have fun too. And you're going to meet really cool people, allies from all over that are going to become friends and are going to join you in your efforts. Yes, and I'm excited because my son Dylan and I will be doing a breakout session. Dylan loves speaking, um, and he's going to be talking about kind of a do-it-yourself inclusive college experience. <laughs> so for families that don't live nearby where there's a inclusive post-secondary education mm -hmm. you know, support, so Dylan's going to be sharing how we kind of developed that for him in Colorado. Um, and then I'll be doing a breakout session on infusing inclusion into all parts of the IEP, not waiting to the end of the meeting when you're talking about um, placement. So um, 
And I had to ask Barb if there's going to be karaoke because that's like one of Dylan's favorite things at the Peak Conference is the karaoke night. So we might have to put peer pressure on Peak to make sure that's a that's going to happen. It's happening. <laughs> okay. It's, <laughs> Good. It's happening. And they have a wonderful silent auction. I'm going to be making an advocacy toolbox for the silent auction. One of my mugs for hello, I'm that parent is going to be in the toolbox for you. <laughs> so that'll be fun. Let's get, pick our winners. And before I do that, there's a couple comments. And let me show you those. This is from Mindy. She says, finding local supports, I feel like a lone ranger. Always bringing in outside information that no one else seems to see the value in. The voices in my head tell me to just be quiet. It's difficult to manage. So, Barb, what what would you say to Mindy? And I know other parents that feel that way too, like they're the Lone Ranger. I think so, Mindy. I think you've really identified. I have to find supports, and. I like local supports, but if I can't have local, I need to have electronic supports, especially in the midst of crisis. And we were having conflicts and the due process. The voices in my head were driving me crazy and I couldn't sleep. And so I tried to just get kind of affirming comments um, or thoughts. And they're on my bathroom mirror, they're all around me. And I would, uh, in, when Wilson was in school, we didn't have the internet, so I called people a lot. So I think that knowing these voices in your head are bugging you is important, and then trying to find, whether it's music or doing whatever else, to um, say, uh-oh, yep, I'm doing really important work, it's driving me crazy, I'm going to go do this for a while, um, and I'm going to talk to this friend or this friend, and um, and professionals. Wilson's had a few just amazing people who believed in the possibilities with him. And so they have been critical supports as well. Right. And we have another comment here about um, Samantha saying, like you, having 13 professionals at our IEP meeting, our first public school IEP, we had 11 people followed by four months of scattered exclusion. Unfortunately, not uncommon. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, and that's why, um, you know, one of my goals as far as having this weekly Facebook live show is a way that we can connect and support each other um, because we don't want you to feel alone. Um, we know what it's like to be up against a system that's like, don't you understand? That's not how we do things. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we want to be there to support you. So, you know, continue to reach out in our group here or, you know, if you want to um, connect also with Peak Parent Center and get their newsletter, you know, there's a variety of ways that you can stay connected. Um, and Angela, let me show you Angela's comment here, if I can pull it up. Yeah, so she said this about the Doug Bicklin quote, um, quote that you gave. And if you write doors in the comments, I will email you the show notes. We'll include Doug Bicklin's comments. Um, and I want to, I'm going to close my eyes and scroll through here and see who the lucky winner, I always have a hard time figuring out how to show books um, of our first book, Schooling Without Labels. So let me close my eyes. I'm going to scroll and I got myself. <laughs> that won't work. I'm going to scroll again. Daisy. Hey, Daisy is from Texas. So Daisy, send me a private message and I will get this wonderful book sent out to you. We have Peak Parents Opening Doors, oops, <laughs> Opening Doors book. So let's see who's going to win this book. I'll scroll through the comments. So the more comments you make, the greater your chance. Mindy, how cool. Mindy, you get a copy of Opening Doors. And this will be perfect, Mindy, because you will find so many great tips um, and so you won't be that Lone Ranger. And 
you'll be able to share some, you know, some new things with your with your child's school. So how cool is that? I love giveaways. Um, let me tell you real quick that Thursday, Paula Kluth is going to be our guest. Wow. And, um, Paula has been at Peak Parent Conferences um, for many times as a keynote speaker, um, but her cohort, Patrick Schwartz, <laughs> is going to be at Peak this year. So I'll also put in the post the link for a Peak um, Inclusive Ed conference that's coming up February. Is it 20th, 21st? Is mm -hmm. that it? Thursday, Friday. Um, and so I'll put the link in the comments. So go register and make sure that you're at the conference and come up and say hi to us and say, yes, I know you, Barb. I heard your stories. <laughs> um, and and you all can, if, if you let us know and we can have a little Charmaine's corner and you all can have lunch <laughs> together and karaoke. Definitely. Will be. <laughs> yes. We'll have Dylan um, make sure that he rounds up everybody for karaoke. <laughs> But then he'll probably just want to be the star on the stage. I don't know. We'll see if he'll share the stage with others. Um, but thank you so much, Barb. I know you are incredibly busy with all the conference planning and all the details. But I just so appreciate that you took some time to be with us and share your stories and your insights and and just the amount of um, support that Peak Parent Center has always given our family. I mean, I look at the, the people that I heard speak when Dylan was three years old, like Judith Snow and Norman Koontz and mm -hmm. Marsha Forrest and Jack Pierpoint and um, Herb Lovett and just like so many people that made such an incredible impact on me. And I brought that back to our family and our family chose that inclusive path for Dylan and it has made such a huge difference. So I have such gratitude to Peak Parent Center because they brought these incredible speakers. So that's why I think the conference is so important for you. It's not like you go to a conference and like, yeah, that was great. It's you go to a conference and you leave changed. Mm -hmm. and that's what we want. And then you carry that back to your school district and you, you know, widen your circle of allies and you do make systemic change for every student in your district. Mm -hmm. So I'm so excited that that opportunity for the conference is coming up in February. Um, Barb, thank you for being our colorful guest today. <laughs> and I don't know if you have any closing words that you would like to add. Um, I think I just want to say that uh, you need to follow your heart and follow your belly and then get things that, um, that, that feel right and then be brave. That bravery is hard, but so I have to go look in the mirror a lot and say, nope, I'm going to do this today. <laughs> and just do what's right and um, people find you and come with you then. So um, believe in yourself and possibilities and persist. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you to our viewers. If you're watching the replay, know that you can still add comments and questions because we'll come back and respond to you. And until Thursday, when we have Paula Kluth on our show, go out and make sure that you keep on keeping on with your advocacy. So everybody take care and we shall see you later.